Hi, everyone. Welcome to Healthy Air. Joining me today from New York is Paul Shiala, founder and CEO of Delos. Paul, welcome to Healthy Air. Great to be with you. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks. I want to share Paul's background briefly in order to provide context for our conversation. After 18 years on Wall Street, including tenant Goldman Sachs as a partner, Paul Shiala's interest in sustainability and altruistic capitalism led him to found Delos, which is merging the world's largest, largest asset class, real estate, with the world's fastest growing industry, wellness. Since the company's inception, Paul has become a leading voice in the wellness and sustainability movements, serving as a keynote speaker at prominent green building, real estate, and technology forums and conferences around the world. Paul is also the founder of the International Well Building Institute, IWBI, which administers the well building standard globally to improve human health and well being through the built environment. A member of the board of directors for the Chopra Foundation and a founding board member of the Just Capital Foundation. Paul graduated from New York University with a degree in finance and he currently lives in New York City. All right, Paul, let's get into it. So, going back to your childhood and upbringing, were there any formative moments that sparked your passion for health and wellness and that motivated you to eventually strike out on your own as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I don't think there was anything, uh, you know, specific in terms of an event or 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 any type of uh, of, of, of thematic bra- backdrop. Uh, I, I think I, like most people, uh, certainly share that common uh, innate desire to be well. Um, and uh, uh, literally that observation uh, uh, when I was on Wall Street, uh, looking at how that could be applied to the real estate sector was really what sparked uh, the origin of the company. Mm. So um, you're 18 years on Wall Street, you, you rose up to become a partner at Goldman, which I can imagine was an intense, all consuming experience. At what point were you starting to think about launching your own business? What what prompted you to eventually take the plunge? And, and how difficult was it for you to leave Goldman where you're extremely successful? Yeah, I would say it was a few years before uh, leaving Goldman. I, um, I couldn't shake this idea uh, with regards to the opportunity to to merge the world's largest asset class with the world's fastest growing industry and started to do a lot of work on the side. And um, it just became more and more obvious that there's a big gap in thought, particularly in the sustainability movement in real estate. Lots of focus on energy, planetary considerations and kind of the environmental impact, but didn't seem to see enough focus on all the people we put inside our buildings, our homes, offices, schools, hotels, 90% of our lives is spent indoors. So it was really that thought process and a couple of years of vetting, uh, getting into uh, an evidence-based approach to see if we could bring this to market. Uh, and then ultimately left uh, what was a perfectly fine thing happening at Goldman. Goldman's a great place and and uh, love, the, love the year spent, uh, spent there and on Wall Street in general, but this uh, seemed to be too big an opportunity to ignore. So your your professional background is in finance, not real estate, public health, medicine. You've talked about that as an an asset for yourself, not a liability in starting Delos. Why? Yeah, it's interesting. I remember starting to assemble thought leadership, particularly uh, doctors, getting them at the same table with architects, engineers, designers, facilities managers, what have you. And I think that outside lens and outside perspective really helped. Uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a architect or designer, but um, looking at getting those two fields together, uh, taking an unbiased approach and, and merging those two um, uh, practices of thought, uh, I think was a helpful um, uh, perspective uh, as uh, we ultimately started to, to to get those professionals to to converse and collaborate and um, started to uncover how much they had uh, really been overlapping yet missing um, in terms of how they could uh, work together to bring forth an understanding of better into indoor environments and, and that impact on on human health and well-being. Hmm. So take us back to 2012 when you started Delos in your first year. What were your early priorities uh, for the business and how are things working out? How, how successful specifically were things like building your team, getting your first customers, raising capital for the business, all the kind of basic blocking and tackling? Yeah, we've been merging the health sciences with the building sciences for about a decade. And the first five years, the first half of that, uh, uh, primarily all research. Uh, and that was our focus, uh, taking an evidence-based approach to connect the built environment with the human condition, looking at all the factors that surround us, air quality, water quality, lighting, thermal, acoustics, biophilic elements, 
uh, putting deep, deep um, uh, framework analysis uh, in place to connect those to our respiratory, cardiovascular, immune, cognitive, digestive, and sleep health outcomes. Um, ultimately, in 2015, we introduced the well building standard uh, based on all of those uh, that thought and, and years of work. But I would say early days was primarily focusing on cementing our position as a global authority, uh, a global standard bearing organization uh, rooted in deep science. Mm. So you uh, you referenced this earlier, but you were cutting against the grain of one of the dominant themes of the built environment in the 20 aughts, which was sustainability. One of your critical insights was that the green building trend in real estate did not have a strong analog for health and wellness, despite health and wellness really being a dominant theme in other product categories outside of real estate. Why had this not caught on in real estate? And then how receptive was the real estate community to health and wellness as a defined product or service category initially? And who is most receptive and who is least receptive? Uh, well, I would say, you know, uh, the, the big picture here is, to your point, health and wellness uh, uh, kind of intentions have been infused into just about every consumer product category we we, we see nowadays, whether it's in food, clothing, what have you. Um, uh, and uh, our thought was, well, why not real estate? Why not our largest consumption, uh, the homes we buy, the offices we spend eight to 10 hours a day? And so uh, taking that approach uh, really uh, introduced something we think quite novel um, and new, um, uh, and this was years back, and it, it took some time. You know, the real estate industry at large is uh, is a slow-moving industry with regards to innovation. So getting architects, designers, facilities managers, developers, owners, operators, all parts of the real estate ecosystem to, to see the value proposition. And intuitively, um, it, it, the spark was, was immediate, uh, of course. Um, uh, why wouldn't we want spaces that are more conducive to our sleeping patterns and our energy levels and, and all of these um, uh, various lifestyle and health outcomes. But codifying that into a scalable platform that can actually uh, put structure and consistency to it was the whole point of the very slow, methodical uh, formation of the well-building standard, uh, putting the years of research in place and then collaborating with industry professionals to, to put forth a program that can scale. How important was the lead model um put out by the USGBC and in influencing your model and strategy for well, which which parts of lead did you try to emulate? And then how and where did you seek to differentiate and improve? Yeah, we saw a playbook with environmental sustainability and said, well, we want to take all the good components of that and, and replicate that for human or biological sustainability. And in fact, we were fortunate to hire Rick Fedrizi, uh, who was the founding chairman and CEO of the US Green Building Council. Uh, Rick effectively birthed lead um, and put that into over 190 countries across uh, 15, 20 billion square feet uh, during his tenure, his long tenure, 15 year plus tenure at the uh, U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, Mr. Fedrizi came over to our International Well Building Institute uh, over four years ago uh, with some great leaders um, and, and they their insights were uh, phenomenal. You know, lead and well do not compete. They're very complementary. Uh, lead online and well online, basically built on the same technology platform. And most of our projects are both lead and well certified. Uh, but having professionals who had really kind of um, uh, set the bar with regards to building rating systems, if you will, with the U.S. Green Building Council was a great leg up for us as we uh, started to look at how this could be applied to uh, directly to occupants and the human experience. Hmm. What was your theory of the case for, for Delos uh, commercially and specifically where, what were your early thoughts on target markets? How did you think about productizing or, or making this a, a, a scalable uh, service for, for customers, pricing it? Um, and then what was right in your early thinking and where did you have to kind of course correct along the way? I think what was exactly right was the value proposition. Uh, you know, whether you're looking at offices or homes or schools or hotels, I mean, there, there, there are different uh, layers of dialogue there as to what matters. But um, at the end of the day, uh, a company CEO looking at uh, driving health, well being, productivity, performance, attraction, retention, reducing healthcare costs, a home builder looking at differentiating their offering versus the guy across the street with regards to amenities that can really speak the language of a of a lifestyle play for for housing. 
Hotels, um, again, a differentiated room experience, driving significant and immediate premiums on cash flow. So th- this was an economic value proposition first that happened to come with a tremendous societal uh, uh, platform uh, with it, uh, you know, using our real estate, our four walls and a roof uh, to introduce preventative medical intentions um, uh, through that built environment is a, a really interesting play on on healthcare and prevention. So the societal uh, mechanism uh, has been in place. The economic engine has been in place. And it's really about uh, been about educating the industry um, on something that after they hear it seems quite obvious. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's fast forward to today. So um, give us a, a sense of the current scope and scale of Delos's business. And then the whole ecosystem model that you have, where you have Delos, but also IWBI and the Well Living Lab. So yeah. give us an overview of the business. Yeah, so Delos at the parent um, uh, organization, the first thing we uh, felt it was important to do was create a separately governed uh, institute called the International Well Building Institute, completely product agnostic um, and process agnostic, but allow for a mechanism for all to achieve um, uh, uh, the well building standard and a well certified designation. That is now approaching 3 billion square feet uh, in over 100 countries globally. So it has become the dominant and globally recognized third party verified system uh, for healthy buildings, healthy spaces, existing buildings, new buildings, what have you. Uh, and that was kind of uh, chapter one, making sure that was um, that was put in place as a way to democratize this IP and to to get this notion that uh, health and wellness in the built environment needs to be positioned as a right not a privilege. Um, and we wanted to make sure to disseminate all of that information, the years of work with the medical community and the real estate community to put forth structure, uh, process, and a way for all to be designated well-certified or well-health safety rated um, in terms of the new launch of, uh, of last year's program. Uh, after that was firmly established, uh, Delos continued to push the envelope. Number one, establishing the Well Living Lab which is a 50-50 founding collaboration with Mayo Clinic and Delos. And that's a research facility that we operate up in Rochester, Minnesota, allows us to simulate indoor environments, a bedroom, a living room, a hotel room, an office environment, and test various uh, health interventions across the spectrum of air filtration, water filtration, lighting, thermal, acoustics, operational protocols, um, to really continue to press the envelope, uh, push the envelope, and, and drive our research agenda forward separating fact from fiction and bringing good clarity to the industry as to uh, what are effective health interventions across these categories uh, on the human condition. Uh, Delos uh, also continued to push uh, and dive in deeper over the years on very specific products, solutions, technology that are good health interventions for any type of space, air filtration, water filtration, circadian lighting. So our platform of vetting and verifying and testing and really driving the evidence-based narrative uh, allows us a really interesting um, uh, way to put forth very specific solutions uh, into uh, into the system. In fact, just in the last seven or eight months alone, Delos has become the nation's largest solution provider, for instance, for air filtration units into school classrooms, uh, having put over a quarter of a million of our uh, uh, technology and solutions into public school classrooms just in the last several months. So really interesting ecosystem here that um, gets into a lot of uh, a lot of different dialogue. What we often tell people at this point is, look, if, if, uh, if it's got a front door, <laughs> four walls and a roof, and, and there's a lot of those in the world, we can either certify it, rate it, improve it with products and programming, or in fact, smarten it up with tech as it pertains to the health sciences. And that's really what the platform's all about. Great. Okay, so let's pick up on a couple of things that you just mentioned there. So first, um, indoor air quality is t- very top of mind right now with the pandemic and has been longstanding a focus area for, for your work. Um, how significantly does indoor air quality factor into the overall health and wellness equation of a building? And then what is your research showing and how is IAQ reflected in your certifications and ratings on the IWBI side uh, and and then on the Delos product and solution side? Yeah, good. Uh, look, pre-pandemic, uh, you know, we, we, we had spent years looking at indoor air quality and direct ties to not just respiratory outcomes, but cognition, performance, mental acuity, sleep, stress. I believe about 16% of all inputs uh, uh, that determine chronic health outcomes 
are in fact respiratory issues. Um, and obviously the, one of the biggest contributing factors to that is, is, is what, what are we breathing? What are we taking into our, our lungs? Um, in fact, uh, through the years, we've learned that indoor air quality tends to be two to five times worse than outdoor air quality, basically anywhere you are in the world. It doesn't, you know, you're not hiding from pollution by going inside. You've got less circulation, more synthetic materials and more challenging indoor air environment. Uh, we've also been uh, researching ultrafine particles uh, for the better part of five years. We understand the exact size of a pathogen concern, uh, such as SARS-CoV-2, uh, and how to uh, put forth effective remediation uh, techniques um, across the spectrum of different technology. So, you know, while it's our um, uh, uh, overall goal here to not only draw attention to um, and start to help define parameters and inputs that matter from a micron size of ventilation, of filtration efficiency, what have you. We also, as mentioned, outside the scope of the rating and certification at Delos, we also are able to put forth best in class recommendations and solutions uh, for specific problems. And um, and that just comes again from, from years of research. There's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of snake oil out there. There's a lot of uh, uh, reckless or even uh, false claims or misleading claims in the industry um, is looking for guidance with regards to you know what 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 does it mean to go uh, this far in inline filtration or standalone filtration and and what 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 type of effectiveness can we actually demonstrate on for instance something like a pathogen concern uh, and that's really where our well living lab uh, comes into play to, to to demonstrate clarity and um, and put the real math and science to reduction of aerosolized particle transmission, reduction of residual on surfaces, and and uh, and put this through a peer reviewed kind of public um, uh, publication uh, mechanism to continue to educate the industry. So again, mm -hmm. research, uh, verification, uh, and solutioning all, all different parts of the organization. Got it. So technology is central to what you're doing, and, and th those include both diagnostic technologies to basically assess risk and performance in buildings in an independent science-based way, and then also technologies designed to mitigate those risks. So you, you mentioned your work around air filtration and purification. Which, which uh, specific technologies are really fundamental to your model today, and which ones do you see being important moving forward? Yeah, good. You know, over the last five years, we've seen everything, um, hundreds of different products, technologies, solutions, methodologies, the bipolar, UV, electrostatic precipitators, inline solutions, standalone solutions. When Delos finds something appropriate, it will go further, uh, contributing IP, contributing research, contributing a, a testing platform, and ultimately uh, locking in on uh, OEM relationships to uh, aggregate demand, drive down supply chain pricing, and put mass volume into the system. Uh, one thing that stood out, one particular technology over the last three plus years that we feel is is, is absolutely unmatched happens to be the uh, IntelliPure and Healthway solution um, uh, from, from, from Healthway. And we've got a great relationship uh, with that organization I've had for years, uh, which has allowed us to uh, be, be uh, in, in a really nice position of, again, solutioning uh, uh, various uh, uh, platforms once the right diagnostics are kind of uncovered and put in place. And you're, you're right, there's, there's two sides of this. Um, one is to assess and determine what's appropriate uh, and then ultimately to bring forth the, right, uh, forth the right solutions for that. The great news here is this particular solution, which we just used and completed in our Well Living Lab uh, uh, research uh, effort uh, for classrooms, we built a classroom uh, and actually modeled out uh, with the desk chairs Mannequins, breathing simulators, cough simulators, top aerosolized particle experts in the world um, uh, to, to demonstrate a pre and post intervention in a particular setting uh, in terms of reduction of, of transmission risk and aerosolized particle um, uh, uh, elements therein. And, and uh, the results are just phenomenal. Uh, you know, in some cases, five factor reduction of risk factors and, and particularly um, so scalable. I mean, you're talking about a couple hundred dollar device plugs into the wall. Uh, I can remove 99.97% of all airborne pathogens, toxins, pollutants, what have you, at a micron size that matters, you know, 0 0.007 microns, something 40 times more efficient than a HEPA filter. So that's really the technology that we've been um, uh, uh, promoting as the best in class uh, uh, solution uh, for any indoor space, whether it's inline or standalone, uh, what have you, but any indoor space, um, this is the right technology to uh, to help scale and 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 help reduce this uh, this concern nationally and globally. Great. 
So um, the pandemic, which we're now going on a year and a half of plus of the world moving through this, um, how has that impacted your business? Both, you know, what what has been the the Delos's experience over the past year and a half, and then in terms of looking at the future, what do you see as the kind of long tail of this experience, both for you and for the healthy uh, building movement more generally? Yeah, look, I think over the first five years of, of, of kind of putting forth these programs, we'd seen considerable adoption of the well-building movement globally. Uh, it uh, turned uh, from, a, from an idea into something with structure, into something scalable, and, and now present in over 100 countries. And then, boom, you know, the pandemic hit. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it took a global pandemic for people to zoom in and realize one very simple thing, uh, which is kind of the core of what our company does, which is the notion that what surrounds us matters. What we touch matters, what we breathe matters, at times how we gather indoors matters, but that fundamental relationship between you and what surrounds you uh, is has been the mantra of, uh, of Delos for the last decade, uh, putting science uh, behind that analysis and then putting forth solutions that can help not only remediate, but also help optimize um, uh, all of the elements that are, that are around us, light, air, water, thermal, acoustics, all these inputs they have a big, uh, big impact. I, I think now, if you, you know, if you asked, um, just taking a look at air quality and the opportunity they're in, you know, if you asked a hundred people in the developed world uh, two years ago about indoor air quality, probably one out of a hundred of those people would have had a thought, care, concern, opinion, or even awareness of, of the notion uh, that there are differences in in air quality basically anywhere you go. You know, that number now is probably 99 out of 100 people in the world. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who hasn't had a thought or concern or care um, about uh, the what's in the air uh, in a space they're about to enter. Um, and this elevated pathogen concern will come and go and others will come and go. But this heightened focus, um, I often compare it to what happened with security after 9-11, uh, you know, when those horrible people flew the uh, uh Flew, flew, flew those planes into buildings. I mean, that, that, that changed security overnight. And um, uh, even though we haven't had to deal with that same type of event, uh, security is still the, uh, unchanged 20 years later with the same types of measures. This has been a massive health shock to the built environment, uh, a massive health security risk. And those things don't, uh, don't, don't come and go. Um, clearly with this pandemic, you know, we'll go through the ebbs and flows and the waves and you know, while Delta is now a current concern, personally, I think the bigger issue is what comes after Delta. Uh, you know, there, if at some point we get to a variant that knocks out all effectiveness of previous vaccines, you know, you're, you're right back to the starting point. And, and unfortunately, I don't think this is going to wane or, or just kind of turn off like a light switch. Uh, the biggest carrier of a viral load, OK, uh, such as this happens to be our real estate, our indoor environment, particularly air quality indoors that that is that is the primary culprit here and thus you've got a 200 trillion dollar asset class real estate that is basically all in need of a fix uh pm10 pm2.5 the old benchmark measures for air quality iaq throw them out the window you, you've got to go much deeper with regards to ultra fine particles uh, and, and 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 the true risk therein and so i think this has been a disruptive mechanism that will ultimately last decades uh, with regards to ultimately something that could be a very positive outcome, which is finally uh, paying attention to the fact that um, the air we breathe, particularly indoors, particularly 90% of our lives, uh, it matters. Uh, it matters during a pandemic and it matters post-pandemic. So um, uh, that that's kind of going to be a big area of focus, we believe. Yeah. So talk about marketing and public communications. Um, you You obviously have an extremely... Uh, accomplished and deep bench of scientific and technical experts. Um, but you also go beyond that to a number of major celebrities. Um, and you're not just talking at scientists to scientists, you're talking to the general public in a lot of your messaging. Why have you adopted this approach, both in terms of going that far out to the public and then, you know, bringing in the folks you have over the past, you know, year, year and a half to kind of be the messenger? Yeah. I mean, we've always been rooted in science. And if you look at the world renowned folks that are part of this and have been part of this effort for, for, for years and years and years, um, you know, that's one side of the equation. The other side of the coin is communicating um, and bringing a general awareness to this. So, particularly as it pertains to, for instance, our well health safety rating, 
which is a subset of the full well building standard. Um, as we started to talk to a lot of consumer facing clients, whether it's your quick serve restaurants or major retailers um, uh, and the like, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, putting that seal on the front door, that well seal was going to not only do something for the organization at large with regards to good third party verification of protocols and procedures, what have you, but also do something immediate from an awareness uh, and a consumer lift uh, and a consumer confidence builder. So we thought it was important to combine people of reach and influence with people of credibility and science and put forth kind of a a PSA-like type of messaging campaign with regards to educating the general public to look for that well seal. Uh, That has garnered now over 4 billion media impressions and and certainly continues to to drive awareness. Mm, Great. At the time of uh, this interview now and beginning of August, the U.S. and the world are at what seems like a a perilous moment in terms of COVID spiking again due to the Delta variant and and other factors, you know, low rates of vaccination among some pockets of the population who either don't want or don't have access to it. How are you personally feeling about our preparedness for combating the, the pandemic over the next several months? I think people have their guard down. Um, I certainly think that there's a lot of fatigue um, and that comes at a time where you've got something that's um, uh, multiple times more contagious, um, hopefully not multiple times more lethal. Uh, I, I think I, I think the jury's out on, on that, but it, it's not a good combination um, and uh, not to sound alarmist at all, but um, I really don't even think Delta is the issue. I, I think it's what comes next, what comes after that at some point. Um, with an under-vaccinated population and people unwilling uh, to actually um, uh, play their part, if you will, in, a, in what it means to be part of a safe society, um, you're going to allow this thing to continue to mutate. And at some point, you'll get something that is so far from what the original vaccination efforts can actually do to handle it that we'll have to start from square one again. So that's not that's not an encouraging thing um, uh, to think about in terms of uh, what our forwards are. Everyone wants to say, hey, let's get this over with and, and return to normal. Yes, we'd all like to do that. Um, I think it takes at least a 70, 75% um, vaccination threshold in the United States. We're nowhere near that still. Um, and, uh, and, and and the world at large, it's um, it, the thing to do at this point is make sure that we are in the meantime, also focused on health and safety protocols, good effective remediation of indoor air quality, uh, and then hope um, that uh, folks continue to uh, continue to um, uh, play their part in uh, in what, it, what it'll take here, which is ultimately a very high percentage uh, of the population vaccinated. Mm-hmm. So um, I like to hear from our guests on their information diet, how they're staying on top of the pulse of the market, how are they challenging their thinking, what where they're spurring new ideas. To this effect, uh, what do you read and listen to on a regular basis? Who are the the people that you really respect and are always kind of checking out what they're putting out there? Um, and then just in terms of your the, the folks that you're interacting with, I'm sure on a regular basis, just through the course of Delos's business, you know, talk to us a little bit about how you're consuming information. I'll tell you what I don't read is um, uh, certainly not for news um, is, 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 is social media. Um, I, I think it's just horrendous what's going on right now in terms of what people are able to just blurt out there and how that spreads uh, in terms of false information. Um, you know, the Instagram, TikTok uh, chatter, and all of a sudden you've got uh, a third of the population believing in ghosts um, uh, uh, some type of, you know, unproven claim about what the, vaccine does here or, or, or doesn't or what have you. So that, that that's just un- unfortunate uh, because it's not regulated. Uh, it takes away from the work of, uh, of, 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 of the agencies that are regulating folks in terms of informing them on, on health sciences. Uh, and now you've got everyone under the sun with a microphone uh, just claiming to be a health scientist and put out some kind of worrisome tidbit that ends up spreading to hundreds of millions of people. And you've got uh, a lot of work to do to re-educate the population on the difference between fact and fiction. So that's just to me a detriment uh, all around mm-hmm. uh, particularly as it pertains to health, health news. <laughs> um, you know, I think you want to rely on folks that have deep experience. Um, I tend to uh, uh, think that uh, Dr. Gottlieb, for instance, has become a very really pretty prominent voice 
formerly head of FDA, um, uh, has, has been spot on with regards to his um, six, seven, eight months now, at least, if not more, of, of forward-looking uh, analysis of where we may be and where we may be headed in uh, in, in, in this type of uh, pandemic. But, uh, you know, regardless, just it's important to try to understand the source of whatever news you're consuming. Um, and if it's coming out of a cereal box or if it's actually uh, relevant uh, to make decisions uh, based on that. Mm. All right. Well, this was a, a great discussion. Before we go here, I want to give you the floor to uh, close with any parting thoughts uh, for our audience. Look, I guess if something good can come out of all of this, uh, if that's even possible to say with this uh, you know, horrific environment we've had globally for the last almost two years, but um, if there is an upshot, uh, it is that solutions exist. Um, they're scalable, they're affordable, um, and they ultimately lend uh, themselves to uh, much more than just solutioning this current environment, but also conducive to overall better health, well being, longevity. Uh, again, pathogen pandemic, crisis, what have you, that's that's of immediate focus and, and need. Um, uh, but all of these things are, are, are intertwined. And if we can look at our indoor environment and realize it is a massive vehicle uh, that can either enable uh, or disable um, our long-term chronic health outcomes, um, uh, that built environment and understanding its impact to us uh, is uh, is a key. And that can be an upshot here, this, this heightened focus on health well-being and health safety uh, in the indoor environment. Look, if you want to breathe better and sleep deeper and have more energy during the day and a balanced circadian rhythm and better cardiovascular, respiratory, cognitive, digestive, and sleep health outcomes, all of that uh, is demonstrated through uh, what amounts to be upwards 70% of the influence uh, on, 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 your, on your outcomes. What surrounds you? Genetics make up 5% of your health outcomes, chronic health outcomes. We can't do anything about that, at least not yet. Lifestyle is about 20 to 25%. Um, the rest, up to 70% of what determines our health outcomes are our surrounding environmental and social conditions, basically where we place ourselves, which in today's day and age is basically indoors, 90% of our time. So focusing on all the elements that surround us indoors, air, light, water, thermal, acoustics, biophilic elements, operational protocols, all these things um, uh, matter. Uh, and so if one good thing can come out of this is, is uh, that heightened attention uh, on an evidence-based approach to make sure we're optimizing uh, our indoors. Hmm. Well, uh, great closing thoughts. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, great discussion, really appreciate you coming on, uh, amazing stuff that you've done, really inspiring. And we wish you all the best in your continued efforts. Eric, thanks for having me. And likewise, the great work you guys are doing as well. Great. Thanks so much.